or on YouTube live with Greg Mercer. For any of you who don't know him, um, he is the Jungle Scout founder and CEO. Um, he is probably the foremost um, knowledgeable person on Amazon FBA, in my humble opinion. He is uh, the original mentor and person that I learned Amazon FBA from um, so many months ago. Um, so we're very excited to have him, and we are going to be taking a super deep dive into product research, um, much deeper than anything else out there. Um, we're going to be going into some of the very advanced topics uh, just for you guys. Um, and so we're going to kick it off uh, right now because we had a little bit of a technical delay, but now we are getting started. So the first question for Greg is, uh, when you see a difference between the Chrome extension of Jungle Scout and the Jungle Scout web app for the same product, um, what is going on there and uh, which data source should you trust? All right. This is an excellent question. I feel like uh, I'm having deja vu here. I feel like I just answered this now. <laughs> I know. Uh, no worries. So... <laughs> To answer this, guys, I'm going to let you know, like, where the data comes from, okay? So, like, when you're using the Jungle Scout extension, the data is pulled in directly from, uh, like, instantaneously, like, directly from the pages, okay? So, what I mean when I say that is when I hit the extension, it is in real time gathering all that information that it's showing you there, all right? And why, the, why I'm telling you this and why this is important, because in the product database, which is inside the Jungle Scout web app, um, it's a little bit different there. So we have like a few hundred million products inside of our database, inside the Jungle Scout web app. And I guess what it comes down to is it's a technical thing. We can't query Amazon's API fast enough to bring in all that information to show you the results there. So instead, it takes like 24 or 48 hours to go through and to update all of the products. Okay, right. yep. So the products in the product database, that's like cache information. It might be one or two days old. Whereas with the extension, it's instantaneously, it's at that exact second. So, you know, like in the product database, it might say uh, a rank's a little bit lower, <laughs> lower, a little bit higher. It might say that there's only like 10 reviews when the extension, that means there's 12 reviews. It's like, okay, well, that just means they got two more reviews within the past day or two. So, right. yeah, hopefully that answers it. Yeah, that makes total sense. So with the web app, it's uh, one or two days behind just because they're organizing so much data. So much is coming in, right? Hundreds of millions of different products available on Amazon, right? The Chrome extension is taking an active query, right? So it might be 24 to 48 hours, a bit more accurate. Does that summarize things correctly, Greg? Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, cool. So the second question for Greg is, um, is the Jungle Scout product tracker 100% accurate? You know, with some of the other competitors out there um, to Jungle Scout who also have a product tracker feature, you know, what's the difference uh, between those two numbers that they might be showing? And uh, could you just talk a little bit about the overall accuracy of the Jungle Scout product tracker? Yeah, sure thing. It's a good question. So again, let's, let's think about like where this data comes from that helps us understand the accuracy. So um, if you don't know about the product tracker to start, it's inside the Jungle Scout web app. And you can add any product on any of the stores, whether it's North, North America or EU or whatever. And on a daily basis, it tracks the inventory. So I might add this um, glass to my product tracker. And it might say, today, my inventory is 900 units. Um, we check inventory tomorrow. It's 950 units. And all we're doing here is... We're asking Amazon to add 999 units to our cart. Right. If it's less than that, it comes back with an error and says, hey, you can't add 999 units to your cart. You can only add 900. So we know that person has 900 units in stock. So if there's only one seller and they have less than 999 units in stock, that particular method works extremely well. Right. Um, it's very accurate. In that particular scenario, I'd say 99% of the time, it's bang on and it's very accurate, okay? But there are some scenarios that can throw it off, and I'll let you know what we do to kind of help those. So okay. one would be um, if there's multiple sellers competing for the buy box, because now what's happening is different sellers are rotating through the, the, the buy box. They have different amounts of inventory. So in this particular scenario, we just give you like a warning that, hey, there's a, a different seller is rotating through the buy box. So just by looking at the difference of inventory isn't an accurate way to tell sales. Right. So in that particular scenario, we estimate sales based off the BSR. And the same thing happens if – another thing I could throw it off, if people have reserved their in, the uh, max order quantity. So if a seller – you know, as a seller, you can say – I. 
want to set a maximum of like three units for anyone to be able to purchase at one time. Right, right. So when that happens, again, it could throw off because we're trying to do this 999 trick thing. Sure. Um, so again, in that particular scenario, we estimate sales for that day based off the BSR. So okay. I like, uh, I'm pretty confident that ours would be more accurate than any of the competitors out there because as far as I know, all the competitors out there, none of them estimate sales based off BSR for the scenarios where the 99 trick doesn't work right. or Jungle Scout does. So that, that gives you a little bit of an idea of like the differences there. Okay, cool. Yeah, no, that, that makes perfect sense. And all my students out there know all about max order quantity and how to protect yourselves as far as, you know, other competitors tracking your sales. Um, so it's good to know what Jungle Scout is doing to provide more accuracy in some of those other kind of one-off cases where the 999 cart trick might not necessarily work. Yep. Um, so thank you for that answer. Um, so is it possible, next question, is it possible to use Jungle Scout um, kind of to identify trending products or, you know, those kind of up and coming products, right? So could you have um, retrospectively maybe identified fidgets or, you know, some of those products that are super hot or they're coming up and, you know, if so, how would you go about using uh, Jungle Scout to identify kind of some of those trending products? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, one of the ways that I kind of like to do it, so this is like pretty hard to do, right? We're trying to spot like our predict future trends, right? Uh, which, of course, everyone would love to do in anything, whether it's <laughs> cryptocurrencies or the stock market the stock or market. Amazon or whatever. Right. Um, there are some ways that you can use Jungle Scout to help you okay. um, do this. So, of course, nothing can see into the future, but you can start to get some like early indicators that this could potentially be like a super hot product using Jungle Scout. Okay. So, one way to do that would be a be like using the product database and find products that have very few reviews. And the reason that this is important is this because um, that's an excellent indicator letting us know that it's a very young, uh, a very young listing. Right. So a very young listing with lots of sales. So if it has like three reviews, but it's still doing like a thousand sales a day or whatever. Right. Um, that tells us that like, this is like very young listing but it's like selling like crazy. So it's like, oh, that's like a pretty good indicator. That's something you'd be thinking about. Like, okay, this could potentially be a good product. Um, that in combination with, you can start like checking Google trends, you know, like I, I've never looked at fidget spinners on Google trends, but if we looked at it, it probably would have been like flat, like zero, nothing. Right. And then, and up then to like, all of a sudden, you know, like a super high spike. Right. Right. So that'd be like a good way to kind of like validate that. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of like one of the ways that you can start to do it. Right. Nothing is going to be able to do the, be able to do this perfectly, right. um, or else I'd be like a billionaire. But yeah, <laughs> that's like a way that you can start to identify uh, like new trending products. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, no, that's that's a great idea. I actually never really thought about it like that, right? Low amounts of reviews with a super high sales, especially like um, within a short period of time since the listing creation is a great indicator and you heard it from Greg directly. So um, you know it must be true. <laughs> uh, so next question, um, how do you see, um, I mean, you've been around for a little bit with the Amazon FBA scene, right? How do you see the Amazon FBA landscape changing um, kind of since you started and what can people do maybe to stay a bit a bit ahead of the uh, ahead of the curve yeah really good question and i like these sets of uh, questions you have here kevin because it's a little bit more like uh, a little bit more like deep thinking or kind of like you know ask my opinion on like the future stuff so i like that That's absolutely cool. let's um, do it <laughs> yeah so now for i don't know like four or five years right? right so when i first got started i was selling like just these wholesale products then i got into the private label thing when i first got into the private label thing there weren't very many people doing it so it was kind of like this blue water like open uh strategy thing it was like it was pretty easy to launch new products not other like private label sellers out there right um of course, that's changed now. It is more competitive, which everyone's aware of, but it's still an excellent opportunity, and you know, in my opinion, like the best opportunity out there. Okay. So, you know, the question was, you know, what can we? How? Where do I see it going? How can I like we kind of stay ahead of it? Um, so now we just have to be like smarter, uh, more data driven, and like better marketers, right? right? So, with any industry, when it begins to mature, it kind of like weeds out like. The people who aren't willing to like put in any time or are really sloppy or aren't doing a good job, they get weeded out, right? And that, that's with any industry as it matures, absolutely. Uh, just like Amazon has. So now we have to be smarter. You know, like I'm a, I'm a very like data driven person, and I'm like a huge fan of that as far as like looking at the numbers, understanding the numbers, understanding what's working, what gets you sales. Um, 
Jungle Scout obviously helps with that, but there's other sources that help with that a lot too, you know. Um, like I mentioned Google Trends, you know, like Keepler, Camel, Camel, Camel. There's like great sources for like data-driven type research or understanding of things. Right. Um, and I, I actually don't think it's going to get much more like competitive than what it is right now, if you want my honest opinion. Absolutely. Um, Amazon is like growing at a really fast rate. And I think the opportunity right now is kind of – or. Um, like education or uh, public knowledge about the opportunity right now. I, in my opinion, it's probably like kind of peaked. It's where it's at. And I think it probably did like a year ago. It's where it at, it's at that it's like competitive enough that the, the people that are like pretty shy or aren't willing to put in their time aren't even going to try. Right. And the people are saying like, okay, like I am going to watch webinars like this. I am going to understand what's working right now. Um, that kind of stuff or, uh, yeah, that's going to kind of like stay the same. So absolutely. I feel like it hasn't really got any like more competitive over the past year. I don't really foresee it getting more competitive in the future. Mm. Um, we just have to be smarter and, you know, do the things that probably like all your students or the things that you were doing now, like, you know, like optimizing our PPC, like having like really good pictures, right. um, just doing a few of these like small things that make a big difference that the people who, uh, you know, like three or four years ago might not have done. They put up like one picture and, I just called it a day, like we're getting yeah. sales from that. <laughs> and just expecting to become a millionaire overnight, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and something else that's maybe worth pointing out here too, guys, is, you know, the USA market, everyone kind of thinks of Amazon as like being this like worldwide beast, right? But Amazon actually hasn't entered certain markets, right? So we still have huge amounts of expansion. Amazon has big plans to enter the Australian market, right? Which is millions and millions of people. Um, so as far as Amazon being, you know, over competitive or saturated or like an opportunity of the past, um, really, you heard it from Greg, uh, you heard it from me, that is absolutely not true. There's so much opportunity, so many millions of different, you know, one-off niche products, different markets that Amazon still hasn't expanded into. And so it's absolutely as much of a, um, as much of an opportunity. Maybe it's not quite as easy as it was years ago before, you know, more people knew about it, but by no means is it over. It's absolutely thriving and um, there's so much opportunity. Um, so Thank you for that answer. Let's go on to the next one. Um, so this is kind of a long-winded question, but it's one that I get all the time, and I think it's important to kind of understand the distinction. Um, okay. So do you target keywords rather than products? And let me give you an example of what I mean. Um, if you identify one strong product, right, through all the filters that Jungle Scout allows you to, right, maybe it has 20 sales with 30K of monthly sales. Uh, but when you search the related keyword, you actually find that the first page of the Amazon search results is full of, you know, thousands of reviews or people that have these huge barriers to entry. Um, so can you discuss your thought process for once you do identify a single product to see if it's worth pursuing? Yeah, this is a really good question. I think this is something that it's kind of complicated, I think, because a lot of people kind of get hung up on it, right? Yeah. So I target a particular like product or niche and not necessarily a keyword. And the reason for this is like how are you going to know what all the keywords are that people are searching for to find this particular like type of product? So um, right here I have uh, a camera lens, right? Um, so like if I find that camera lenses are good opportunities, how do I know whether people are searching for, uh, what is this, like Sony camera lens or are they searching for a 50 millimeter or are they searching for like there's dozens or if not hundreds of different like keywords that people are searching to land upon this particular camera lens, right? Absolutely. So, um, so what I do, I try to find a particular type of product or niche guess what like my one or two main keywords would be. So for this, I'd probably guess, you know, since there are so many camera lenses, I'd probably guess one of my main keywords for this is like 50 millimeter camera lens. Or if I had this glass, um, uh, gla you know, like clear pint glass or uh, pint glass or something like that would be like my main keyword what I think for this particular glass. And that's where I then go on to try to understand what the um, – demand and competition is for like for that particular keyword. So right. I would encourage you not to get too hung up in that stage because people might like, I think some people get stuck on saying, but wait, what if pint glass isn't the main keyword? What if it's really this or that or the other thing? And there's not very much demand on um, pack of 12 pint glasses or something right. like that. Um, 
So I would encourage you like not to get hung up on that part. Just pick like the one or two what you think would be the major keywords and choose those and kind of gauge the demand and competition off that. Right. Yeah, and that I mean that's absolutely that's great advice, right? So and there's ways to kind of verify, you know, those guesses. Like there's there's services out there like Merchant Words, right? Um, and those are estimated keyword volume, as all my students know, right? The only true source of uh, keyword volume is from the search engines. So you know you can further verify through Google Keyword Planner, right? You want to make sure that you notice the discrepancies between Merchant Words and Google Keyword Planner, as Amazon is a buyer centric product search platform, right? And Google is not necessarily geared a hundred percent towards product research right so um, let's go on to the next question um, many of my students kind of ask me all the time about product research in the UK and sometimes other markets right so can you talk about how that is different from the USA product research and any tips or tricks you use specifically with Jungle Scout um, kind of to be able to do that international research as it is I'm sure you know different in certain ways yeah, absolutely. So just to start, uh, people always ask this too, so I'll just say it's Jungle Scout works for all the North American stores, that's Canada, U.S., and Mexico, all the EU stores. I'm not going to try to name them because I'll probably mess it up, <laughs> yeah. and uh, in India. Okay. okay. So I think that's like nine or ten marketplaces or whatever. So it works for all of those. Um, if you've seen any of my webinars before, or podcasts, or whatever else, um, oftentimes I like talk about like this criteria. I look for like a certain, uh, like a few thousand units of demand, like in the U.S. store, um, I do say like I'll tune back my demand and competition expectations for the less popular marketplaces. So that's really everything besides the U.S. So right. the U.S. by far has the most amount of demand as well as competition. So like me personally, to enter a niche, I want to see in the U.S. like 3,000 units of demand. So if, again, if I'm looking at pint glasses um, and unfortunately there's no beer in here, just water. Uh, <laughs> that's for tomorrow, right? <laughs> later tonight, later tonight. Um, you know, I'm looking that there's like 3,000 units of these being sold throughout the entire niche on a monthly basis. Where if I'm right. looking um, at one of the EU stores where there's less demand, then I'm going to be looking, I'm going to be expecting less demand. So I might enter that niche in the EU if it has like 1,000 units of total demand or 1,500 units. So right. I scale back those expectations. But I also expect it to be less competitive. So I expect to see less listings. Exactly. I expect to see less reviews on the listings. Um, and then, yeah, that, that's what I recommend for anyone else watching this to, to do the same. Right, yeah, and I mean, it's important to think about just the differences in culture too, guys, right? Because, you know, you want to understand what the market is like, ready, right? If you live in England, then maybe you know a little bit more about the culture, you know that they might be more, you know, attuned to drinking tea or having tea products or, you know, whatever it is, right? So use your personal knowledge as, you know, an experiential advantage um, for doing your product research in whatever market you do want to enter, right? And so that's great advice from Greg, everyone. So um, can you talk quickly, next question, can you talk quickly about the niche hunter within Jungle Scout um, and what specific benefits a Jungle Scout user would get from using this feature rather than just using the Jungle Scout platform? Yeah, that's a good question. So if you're not familiar with it, Niche Hunter is one of the features inside of the Jungle Scout web app. So inside there, there's like three main features, right? There's like the product tracker, there's the product database, and there's a thing called the Niche Hunter. And um, just going real quick, we kind of talked about the product tracker, right? That does like the 999 trick or right. estimates based on the best sellers rank and kind of tracks products. I'd say like it kind of like look at uh, products underneath a magnifying glass over a certain time frame. Okay. The product database, it's a catalog of all the Amazon's products with special filters so it's easier for us sellers to kind of search through them. And then the niche hunter, it's a little bit different. So whereas the product database, we've rebuilt Amazon's catalog and just loaded in all the products and lets you search through them that way. With the niche hunter, we've taken real customer search terms. So these are real buyers in the search terms that they're using. Um, and We've kind of like taken it a step further. We've taken that search term and then we've graded that search term, which is essentially a niche, right? Uh, we've graded that search term or the niche for um, how strong the demand is, how strong the competition is, how stout the, um, the, the quality of the listings are. So like are there a whole bunch of high-end uh, high listings there or are they like crappy listings? Right. And then we also give it like an overall opportunity score. So this is just like another way to look for um, niches or type of products to go into. So, um, you know, unfortunately, 
computers aren't quite smart enough to like just give you the absolute best opportunity on Amazon that specific day. Um, I'm waiting for them to get there. We are <laughs> we are starting to do some more machine learning stuff, which is really exciting, but it's okay. not quite there yet. So you still do have to kind of weed through different like niches, right? Like right. one might be a um, a t-shirt for an NFL sports team, and you know, like since you're not licensed to sell that product, you can't really sell that. So it's like okay, you have to skip the that one. So you still have to kind of like manually look through the different niches and see they're they're good. Right. But we we get you like a lot of the way there, right? Cause we can't tell how much demand's in there. We can't tell um, how stout the competition is, right. how good approximately the opportunity is. So um, it's just another way to look for types of niches or products to go after. Right. Okay. So a quick follow-up question on this. Um, some of my students were asking me to ask you. Um, so when you are evaluating kind of the competitive landscape of a new potential niche that you are going to enter, what would you kind of rank maybe as like the top three barriers to entry, you know, with pictures, descriptions, reviews, what would you say are the top three most important things to be looking at to be able to enter that market? Um, so like the things that I used to gauge competition off of? Right, like so maybe you'd say like, you know, the number one thing that's hardest to kind of come into a market and beat is reviews. Maybe the next might be really good pictures, right? Maybe the third might be, you know, excellent uh, copy in their bullets or something like that. What would you say is the number one most important uh, kind of barrier to entry to coming into these new uh, niches and kind of trying to, you know, break in? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I don't think I could quite say like one particular thing, but I can give you kind of like the package that I look at right. to uh, gauge like how competitive a particular niche is. Even better. And, yeah, so like without a doubt, one's the um, number of reviews. Absolutely. And the number of reviews, so like you can outrank products um, that have like much higher like number of reviews than you, okay? So like that isn't necessarily an exact gauge of like how well a, a product ranks there's we know that there's like lots of things that go into the a9 algorithm absolutely but it is a good indicator of um maturity of a listing and like how many units the listings um uh, selling so yeah. if we think about big picture right here what we need to be successful on amazon is we need to organically rank well for some of like for a lot of the search terms right or a lot of the the search terms that buyers will be searching for to purchase our product. So I guess we're, what we can be thinking about is what do I need to do to outrank those or like rank well for my search terms? Right. Um, so to beat people in their rankings, like if we reverse engineer this, it's like what do we need to do to beat people in their rankings? So um, one would be we need uh, sales velocity. Um, so our product needs to be selling well. Uh, we know for a fact that's one of the major things that Amazon takes into account in yep. their rankings. We need a good conversion rate. Um, to get a good conversion rate, there's a whole bunch that goes into that. There's social proof. There's good pictures. There's a good title. There's good product descriptions. Right. Um, we need to rank well for keyword relevancy. So we need to make sure that we're being indexed for our keywords that we want to be selling under. So. Knowing and understanding all that, the things that we can be looking for to see whether or not there's listings that we can beat out, we need to be looking to see like what's their sales history and sales velocity like, and number of reviews is a great gauge for that. We need to be thinking like how much social proof do they have, which leads to a higher conversion rate. Number of reviews is a great one for that, right. so that's why it's very important to me. Um, the other things that I'm looking at are um, – how good are my competitors listings because I, I want the conversion rate of my listing to be better than my competitors. Right. So if they have crappy listings with like one or two pictures, which there's still a lot of listings on Amazon like that, then that's much easier for me to outrank them. Um, so yeah, th those are the types of things I'm looking at. I'm looking at like how good are the listings? How many reviews do they have? Um, I'd be probably looking at like how many sellers are there for this particular item. Like, a good indicator if I'm trying to, we, since this is like the theme of the night, the pint glass. <laughs> if I search pint glass and on that page, Amazon's starting to show me irrelevant search results. So if I search for pint glass and Amazon's starting to show me um, those like little table coasters that you put glasses on right. or I don't know, some other like kitchen appliance or whatever, that means like there's not 
a lot of what Amazon believes are relevant products for that particular search term. So again, that, that'd be like a good indicator that it's not a super competitive niche. And this, that is an incredible point that I will personally admit I've never thought about. Um, and I'm definitely going to um, do a lot of research on uh, once we do end this webinar. So thank you so much for that. That is an incredible answer um, and very detailed sure. answer. So appreciate that. Um, let's go on. So we have one more question and then we're going to kind of take a little bit of a deep dive into showing you how uh, the Jungle Scout founder himself does product research on the platform so this is the final question before we do that so definitely stay around um, if you are interested in seeing that uh, so the question is uh, with other software popping up kind of as competition you know amaze owl unicorn smasher uh, viral intelligence's new uh, product market intelligence um, can you talk about first um, how some of these competitors can offer their platforms for free um, and then second how you know jungle scout differentiates differentiates itself uh, from some of these new guys kind of popping up yeah it's a great question so um, at jungle so to build like a let's just say like a pretty like mediocre um, like product research platform, it's not really like super difficult, and because of that it's like a low, it's a relatively like low barrier of entry to build like a pretty like mediocre and maybe kind of like poor quality like platform. So I'll just start by kind of like saying that right. um, to build a very like high end platform with like strong data integrity and accuracy is like so much harder. So just to give you an idea, like there's Kevin and I were talking about this for the webinar, but there's actually, there's like, there's over 30 people now working at jungle scout. Um, Amazing. Like we have a PhD on our team who is a data scientist. So like his job is to be working on the accuracy of our sales estimates and the integrity of our data and a lot right. of those things. Uh, we have, you know, not, not to like bore you guys, like all the technical stuff, like the no, amount it's important. of, kind of like work we do like behind the scenes to make sure this data is like accurate and good. Um, it's pretty incredible that like most people wouldn't understand and I don't expect you to just, that's no big thing, but what you need to kind of be thinking about is um, like for me personally, at least like when I think about this, like who cares like if data or like numbers that you're given are free if they're not accurate. So Absolutely. because that, that could potentially be like a pretty um, detrimental like blow to your business. And if I just give you an example, like what if um, I have my Jungle Scout uh, sunglasses here? What if like <laughs> I, I download like a competitor's product or, or someone else's product that maybe has like pretty like poor quality data, right. and they tell me that Jungle Scout orange sunglasses are selling like ten thousand units a month like throughout the niche? So I'm thinking like sweet. Then I'm gonna plop down like three thousand dollars of my own. Um, capital so I can order like a few thousand of these uh, Jungle Scout sunglasses. But then I get in to find out that, oh, it's actually only like 10 units a month instead of like 10,000. Right. So it's like, yeah, you got the data for free, but like I just wasted like $3,000 $3, of my capital. <laughs> uh, so that's why like I really encourage you guys and like on our blog, we have, we're, we're pretty public about um, like our data science, like a lot of things that go into it. And we're pretty transparent about that, and I'd encourage you guys, like if you're thinking about some of the competitors, not like not not want to like bash them and say like they're all, all garbage, but right. I would like encourage you guys to like ask them the tough questions. It's like, you know, like what do you do to um, accurate or uh, accurately estimate unit sales? Like, what's your team like? What's maybe like some of the science behind it? Some of those things, and uh, like oftentimes what you'll find is it's. Uh, pretty weak it's kind of more so just like a, a rough estimate but um and like their selling proposition instead of like the quality of the data and the accuracy of the data is that it's free right. you know so um yeah. so yeah i would just you know you've asked me the question i encourage anyone listening or watching this like why don't you go out there and ask some of the other platforms to tell you a little bit more about uh what's going on behind the scenes right no and this is this is exactly why when people ask me you know why would I pay you know, X amount of dollars for Jungle Scout when I could get this for free? My answer is always the same thing because Jungle Scout is giving you guys the most accurate data out there of any software platform. And I'm not just saying that's because I'm you know, talking with Greg. It's because I really believe in the software. You know, I was using Jungle Scout as a user before I had ever met Greg, right? And so you really have to um, kind of weigh the benefits and costs of getting that you know, incorrect or potentially you know, data that's not so, you know, uh, perfect as far as the accuracy, right? Because it's so important to establish that pattern of sales using the Jungle Scout product tracker, right? Using the 999 cart method, you can't just take a look at like an immediate um, sales 
uh, metric from any of these uh, software, right? Because it could be a giveaway that's distorting the overall BSR of those uh, monthly sales, right? So it's very important to look at a trend, look at the product tracker, um, sales data for yourself, right? Don't make any rash decisions as far as product research goes because it's a very um, long-term type thing, right? If you're going to invest your own capital, you want to be sure in it. And the way to be sure is by having the most accurate data. And the way to get that most accurate data is by using the best software, which in my opinion is Jungle scout right and so let's go into the most exciting portion of the uh, training we are going to actually uh, show Greg performing some uh, jungle scout research live so while I ask you the question I'm gonna go ahead and um, allow you to share your screen um, so a common concern that I hear from all of my students um, is that with so many people, you know, on Jungle Scout, on Amazon FBA now, sometimes uh, people could kind of be using Jungle Scout with the same or similar filters that a lot of the like Amazon, you know, people out there are kind of teaching, right? And so with all of these people looking at maybe some of the same filters, um, how can we be sure that we're not all looking at the same product? So would you, if you'd be so kind, take us through some of the kind of out of the box creative ways to use Jungle Scout, you know, one or even maybe two steps further than most people are using to identify products so we can really find those true diamond in the rough type products. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just to confirm, can you see my screen? I can, yeah. All right, excellent. So, um, yeah, so what, I'm, what we're looking at right now, this is the Jungle Scout uh, product databases inside of the web app, if you guys aren't familiar with it. Um, I'll just go over, I think everyone watching this maybe have a little bit of an idea, like uh, Product Research 101. Yeah, absolutely. If not, then maybe um, one of the other like videos on our site or something would be better for you guys. So I'll, during this, I'll kind of cover like maybe a little bit more advanced stuff. Or exactly, some stuff yeah. That, like a lot of people aren't talking about. Sure. Um, one of the ways that like I really, one of the things that I really like to do, and I wouldn't say this is like a great like hidden secret. There's definitely people out there doing it, but definitely not enough. Is to be looking for products that need. Um, oh, there's a few different things here, but like the first one would be looking for products that need some um, improvements. Okay, so you know, just think like if we're looking at products that are selling well, even though they have a crappy like review rating. Um, this is an excellent opportunity for you, right, to sell the same thing except make some small improvements on it. So we can say, like, hey, only show me products that are selling at least 500 units a month, even though the rating's less than – and I'll give you a little trick here. I'm going to say, like, 3.7 stars. at three. Uh, um, so Amazon rounds when you're looking at – let me show you what I'm talking about here real quick. So Amazon rounds when they're looking at a uh, – like when they fill in the number of stars here, right? So this seller has 2.8 out of 5, but it's like visually the consumers are seeing three stars. Here this guy has 4.7, but they're seeing um, 4.5, right? That kind of sucks because it's like pretty close to 5 but people aren't seeing it. But um, that's good to think about when you're searching things because right. I'm going to say show me everything that has 3.7 or less. Because visually, a consumer is saying that's three and a half stars. Um, so real quick, we could just look at some of these. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through this kind of quickly. Uh, like I said, expecting that um, you guys already know about this a little bit. Right. Um, and then through here, we can be looking at these products. And we can um, be saying, like, which ones look relatively simple that I can make improvements to. Right. So, you know, this looks like a pretty simple product right here. I can look at it on Amazon. I can go down. I can take a look at the reviews. Right. This has a ton of one-star reviews. So it's like, okay, what do we need to do to make this thing better? Um, uh, barely holds the seat together. The worst slings ever for pool <laughs> noodles. Um, the fabric doesn't stay on. Uh, dun, 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 doesn't come with noodles. So just after reading that for 10 seconds, it seems like people are under the pressure that it either comes with noodles. So we can pretty easily improve that by just saying that, like maybe like graying that out and making it very clear that all you get here is the sling. Right. It looked like the other thing was that this fabric either like tears it easily or doesn't um, stay on. So maybe I ask my factory in China to like on the back side of this to put like a little bit of rubber or like something else so it doesn't like slide around as easily. Right. Or I don't know. If you give me a few more minutes, I can probably think of some more ways for it to stay on. No, definitely. 
yeah, fabric quality is super easy, right? It's like you just talk to the factory. It's like, hey, I want something like thicker, or heavier duty. That's pretty. That's super easy for them to like put something else on there. So wait, uh, while, while while I have you, um, a common yeah. question that my students ask all the time and would hate me if I didn't ask you is: so if you want to if you want to source a product from Alibaba, but you want like some custom alterations, how are you going about doing that, right? So if you see a product and you want to make some changes to it, but maybe you know no factory is is advertising that they do those exact things. How are you going about? making those custom changes and kind of you know making the product your own and adding that value yeah so i just work with the factories and i usually talk about that when i initially reach out to them right. to go ahead and weed out the people who aren't going to be working with me so i i just launched a product um like two weeks ago which where i did this too right. um it's called jungle snugs um so this is like thicker fabric than uh, my competitors, right? right? So my competitors, uh, in some of the bad reviews, it said like the, this fabric, uh, fabric thickness is measured in like GSM grams per square meter. Their fabric was like 300 GSMs, and they're getting bad reviews saying that they um, that it was like too thin, right? Right. So I just when I reached out to these factories, so I I went on Alibaba, I searched for hooded baby towels, and when I reached out to these factories, I said. Um, Hey, I'm looking for like a hooded baby towel, the bamboo material, uh, this, that, and the other thing, and I want a thicker fabric. So I didn't um, specifically specify 500 GSM instead of 300. Right. I just like I was trying to like work with them. It's like, what other fabrics do you have available, or you know, could you um, like make for this? So so yeah. fab some factories were like, oh, all we have is 300 GSM. Um, if you want thicker, like the MOQ is like a billion units cause we have to like make a whole new roll of fabric. I don't know how fabric's made, but, yeah. um, and then one other factor was like, Oh, well, we actually do have a roll of, uh, 500 GSM fabric we can use. I'm like, okay, sweet. Perfect. So my advice to you would be to go ahead and put like which, what type of alterations you're going to make in your initial email with them. Right. And uh, leave it like fairly open ended. So if we go back to the example of let's see, we're looking at like pool noodles. Instead of like the the thicker fabric thing or the thicker like sling thing would be fairly easy. You just say like, hey, I want like a heavier duty like fabric. What do you have available for that? Right. And but instead of saying like, hey, I want to put rubber on the inside of these, I'd probably start off with saying like, I want. Um, Float, what are they? floating? I don't know these things are called seat noodle seats, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I'd say like I want a way for my noodle seats to stay on better, um, and open it up with just like that. And maybe they already have an idea, or maybe they already have like a modification they've done before that they can hook you up with. If not, you could say like you know, could you put rubber on the inside of those so it's like uh, has better traction than just the the nylon or whatever does. So yeah, that'd be my advice for it. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so this is one way to use the web app that, um, surprisingly enough, not enough people do because right. I don't know why this is like a, a fantastic way to find. Like I never would have – I've never seen pool noodle seats before. I never would have thought of that product or thought to improve that product without it. So that's like something pretty cool. And it's interesting um, to look at too, guys, that, that Greg's not using you know 3.75. And he's not using 20, right? Because everyone out there, humans, it's just human nature to make round numbers, right? You want to put in 3.75, you want to put in 4, you want to put in $20. So he's changing that up to see different products that you guys might not otherwise see by using those round numbers. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, something else that I commonly do is use like the listing quality. So anyone not familiar with this, we rank all the the quality of all the listings on Amazon between one and a hundred. I was actually just today I was working on a new algorithm to update this. Um, but so like uh, a score of lower scores like pretty bad. So let's just say like a score of like I don't know thirty five. Um, and like from what I know, I don't think a lot of people even use this at all. But um, so we'll say like at least like eighteen bucks. Let's say um, estimated sales is let's do something pretty high. Let's do like a thousand units. So this thing selling a thousand units a month, even though it has a really cr crap listing, right? Um, and it's above eighteen bucks. So we'll see what kind of results we have. And again, right? Like some of these, like I'm not going to sell Nike shoes, right? So no. we'll skip right over that. Yep. However, I'm sure there are some products, and I didn't even filter by category, but I could do that to weed out a lot of these. Um, like 
hinges. This is something that's like pretty strange. I never would have thought of, right? Right, like um, necessity type items that people are going to buy regardless of whether, you know, the listing is well made or not. Maybe you could come in, create that, you know, that listing optimization that they're not worried about doing because they know people are buying it anyway. Yeah, so it's crazy, right? This thing's selling like twelve or 1,300 units per month. It has one star. It has like, uh, you know, probably hardly any of their main keywords used here because like their uh, title's pretty short. Yeah. Their bullet points are pretty short. Yeah. Um, if I scroll down here, like there's like a crappy product description, right? It's like three sentences. <laughs> I could easily make a really high-end one with lots of keywords. I can right. do enhanced brand content. So this is something that is like, I think is like easily disruptible. If this guy is selling 1,300 units per month, um, with like this really crappy listing, it's like, guys, if you launch these, uh, um, door hinges with like a really nice listing, it's like, <laughs> I, you could easily steal probably like all of his sales. Right. Exactly. So that's a pretty cool way to use it that like not a lot of people are doing. No, that's great. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so that's one little tip. Um, one, a couple cool ways to use the, um, extension that not a lot of people do is, I don't like, I'm a huge fan of this, but I guess I don't talk about it too often. And most people I talk to don't really do it, but you can go to a seller's storefront. You can click on the extension there and this is going to pull in all the different products that this particular seller is selling. Right. right. So I like doing this, especially on like private label sellers and they're pretty easy to pick out once you kind of know what um, you're doing with private label sellers. Right. Because, right. um, you know, they're doing like the, the bullet points, the first words, all caps, and it's just, it, it's kind of easy to start picking them out. Right. But, you know, this guy, it looks like it's just a, um, it doesn't look like this is like a private label seller from what I can tell. They're probably just sourcing it from a wholesaler or something, but right. I really like doing this on a private label seller. You can um, sort it by estimated sales, and then you can see what some other sellers' best-selling products are, right? Right. So, we can do an example real quick. Let's just search for like uh, what's something that a lot of private label sellers are doing. Um, watermelon slicer. My, my my students are laughing right now, Greg, because this is one of like the main uh, product research methods, or one of the you know m few main ones in the course, and what I've kind of taught on YouTube myself that I've found so many kind of diamonds in the rough. Oh, in. nice, nice. Yeah, yeah. hardly anyone does this. So I'm I really know. glad actually that you're teaching them that because it works really well, right? And they're so far down the rabbit hole to go through this because it's basically infinite. Right. Yeah, for sure. So this guy, he only has one product, but yeah. So if you've seen this class, you already know what I'm going to do here, but right. uh, yeah, it's like infinite, right? There, yeah. There's tons and there's tons to do. Right. Um, so yeah, the, those are like a few of my, probably my favorite things that most people out there aren't doing um, and really help you find kind of a little bit more like obscure products that probably a lot of people uh, aren't searching for. I'll also just say like, I wish Jungle Scout had like a billion users or whatever, but um, <laughs> The number of users, even in Jungle Scout, is so tiny compared to like a how many sellers are on Amazon and b how many customers are on Amazon. Right. You know, even if even if we had like let's say like a hundred thousand users, it's like that would still be like a very small fraction of a percentage of like how many sellers are on Amazon and how many buyers are on Amazon. So right. it's like you know, there's still like there's just such an abundance of. Um, an abundance of opportunities on Amazon that, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't get too hung up on thinking that like everyone else is selling the same thing right. unless it's the watermelon slice or the fidget spinner. <laughs> or the garlic press. Or the garlic press. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So we have like five minutes left. I have um, some students that are absolutely dying to ask you a couple more questions, um, if you'd be so kind. Um, yeah, sure, let's do it. So one of the questions that I get all the time is, you know, I'm trying to kind of get my feet wet in Amazon FBA, but I don't necessarily have the upfront capital to get these like big MOQs, right? A thousand units, two thousand, five thousand. What is a kind of way that you found maybe to get that MOQ down a bit um, for, you know, maybe new sellers or people who are on a little bit more of a budget with factories? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, what, what, like a small little kind of like hack you can do is um, you can tell them this is like a test order, which that's not even really like a lie, right? Like any like first order is kind of going to be a test order. Yeah. Um, so like what I'll often say is, you know, like we like to build relationships slowly. We want to make sure that this is like of high quality. Uh, um, so we want to start off with like a hundred unit test order. If that works out, I'll have much larger orders in the future. And that's not even a lie, right? Because like you... I mean, that's true. You want to make sure that's good quality. And if it yeah. does well and it starts selling really well on Amazon, you are going to order a whole bunch. So right. that's something you can do. 
Um, oftentimes you can. All right. So one thing to think about is um, if you're doing small MOQs, don't expect a bunch of modifications, especially if like a new mold has to be made or this, that, or the other thing. Right. Um, so that's one thing you need to keep in mind if you only have enough capital for a smaller MOQ. Something else to keep in mind, and I've been fortunate enough to get to go to China. I've been to like China like three times. I've visited a whole bunch of my suppliers, and it kind of really opened up to my eyes like the difference of some of these factories. So some of these factories are just like huge, right? Like so big, like a billion people working in them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and those types of – factories are not a good fit for a small seller. They're not interested in doing a run of a hundred uh, units. Right. Right. But then I've been to like some of my other factories and I, I don't have very many of those like giant ones cause they, they don't really want to work with people like me. They want to work with like Walmart and Home Depot and other people. Right. But I've been to some of my other factories and there's just like 20 people working there. And you know, it's like a 2000 square foot, like a small factory. Um, and they're doing like these smaller orders. Like those are a better fit. Um, for like people who want to do like smaller MOQs. So on Alibaba, like half the information on Alibaba is garbage, right? Because right. they just like filled in themselves. So a lot of it's like not very accurate, but you want to be looking for um, factories that have like smaller capacities. And then after that, it's just kind of like reaching out and finding ones to work with, right? Because right. The, the small factories that only do have 10 or 20 people working there and these small production lines and stuff, they're happy about d doing an order for like 100 units or 200 units or whatever, right? But if it's this huge factory with 900 people working there, it's like they, like, they it's can't just not run worth that it. through their production line. That just, just doesn't make sense to them. So right. it's a lot of it's about factory fit is what I'm getting at. Right. Yeah, no, and that's a great answer. My, I'm getting a bunch of messages again because I actually have a script that's literally how to ask for a test order to uh, test the quality before nice. a larger order. So nice. I, I'm loving that we're on the similar wavelengths here. Yeah, um, it sounds like you have an excellent course. <laughs> thank you. Um, I hope so. I think my students would hopefully agree. Um, so we're going to ask Greg one last question, and then we're going to give you guys a very special offer um, to be able to kind of save some money uh, getting Jungle Scout, getting the best product research uh, tool out there with all the most accurate data. So um, what I personally want to know is, you know, could we maybe have any hint of uh, new software, new features that we might see from the Jungle Scout team? Are we ever going to see like a merchant words type clone for keywords kind of in the, you know, platform and ecosystem itself? Or um, are there any hints that you might be able to give us as far as where you guys are going kind of in the future? Ah, yeah, good question. I don't think I saw this in the, the list of questions you sent me an hour before, did I? No. <laughs> um, no, I'm happy to share that. As you know, I'm a pretty like transparent guy. So um, there are some really exciting things I don't think I've ever shared with like the general public. This would be the first time. So there you go, guys. One would be we've been working really hard the past month on a brand new extension that – um, it was actually like the first alpha version was given to our UX designer today to go through and look at the design, make sure it is adequate. Um, after that, there's a few more tests before we're ready to release it to the public, but you can probably expect that in the next couple of weeks, as long as there's no major bugs or anything like big found. Um, right. It's, um, and it's nice. I, I like it a lot. It gives some like new pieces of data that no one else is doing. Right. It's also just kind of like a fresh coat of paint. It looks nice, a little bit better user experience. So, um, you can look forward to that, and of course, all all updates are always included with anyone who owns any of our stuff. So if you have another extension, it's not like you have to buy anything else. One day you'll just see this uh, beautiful new uh, extension that you'll love. So right. um, that's really cool. Really excited about that. Um, we're not coming out with any other software platforms um, anytime in the foreseeable future. So okay. um, as you know, you know, we have like Jungle Scout, which is the product research platform. We have JumpSend, which does email automation. It's also a deal site to uh, help you boost your sales. Right. Fetcher is the profit analytics and accounting. And Splitly is an A-B testing tool specifically for Amazon sellers. So we have those four platforms. And what we decided about like a year ago as we are like building out more platforms is that we really wanted to double down on the quality of everything that we're doing as opposed to like expanding more horizontally. So right. 
a lot of our focus is on Jungle Scout, but also to make sure the other apps are good. It's like we don't want any just like mediocre applications or pieces of software. It's like everything we do, we want people to say like Jungle Scout is without a doubt the best in the business at this accomplishing this one task. So we've really been doubling and tripling down on just like the quality of everything that we're doing. Right. Um, so like another little thing that I haven't actually shared with anyone else is, you know, earlier we talked about the sales estimates stuff. Um, we, we hired a new um, engineer, let's see, about like two months ago that was like, it, that's has some excellent experience and is really good with a lot of um, kind of like forward thinking, like big data, uh, machine learning and like the artificial intelligence stuff. And what we're working on right now, it's like um, estimate our sales is going to just be like, it's a lot better than what we have, but it's just going to be like leaps and bounds better than everyone else because it's going to be like a very like dynamic um sales estimates like if you check multiple times in the same day it's going to be a little bit different because it's like always adjusting um yeah not to like nerd out on you guys like too much but it's, no we it's love great. it i and love I think, it uh, yeah like literally it's like process, it's going to be processing billions of data points every single day monitoring all the sales in all the different um categories and marketplaces through like the days and seasons and weeks and um just doing a lot more like advanced stuff to like really give you guys like this really accurate information so that's something that like i'm really excited about we've been working really hard on lately um yeah there's just you know there's we have let's see i think we have 11 engineers right now so like we're constantly always doing lots of um small updates and small features and all this kind of stuff but that'd be that'd be a few like the big things i'm really excited about right now cool Thank you, man. Hey, well, that's that's what you want, first of all, in a software founder, right? He's not charging you for the updates like, you know, some people, a lot of people do. And they're doubling down on, you know, increasing the quality rather than trying to put out all of these different systems that aren't necessarily quite ready yet. And we got two never heard before fresh from Greg's mouth uh, about, you know, some of the Jungle Scout secrets. So you heard it here first, guys. Um, and so let's give them um, the offer. Um, Greg has been kind enough uh, to extend an offer of the discount for Jungle Scout for everyone out there watching. Um, the offer is available, you guys, at www.junglescout.com slash Kevin, right? And so if you guys are interested, if you know you want to get into the Amazon FBA space or you haven't taken the plunge to get Jungle Scout, maybe you've been using some of the free software out there, but you want to get more serious and you want to kind of you know make sure that you're getting all of the best available data head over to www.junglescout.com slash Kevin. Uh, I'm going to have it available in the description in the YouTube video and again once we share it on Facebook. So Greg, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. It's so amazing to be talking to you. You're the first person I found. Um, I think of you as kind of my own Amazon mentor. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely, Kevin. Thanks a lot for having me on. It's been a really good hour and I've, uh, I really appreciate everyone tuning in. Absolutely, man. So we will talk to you soon. All right. Sounds good. Take care.